Okay, we'll start with diabetic ketoacidosis in pediatric age group. Uh, you will notice when you move to your internal medicine, irritation that management of DKA in pediatrics is different from management of DKA in adults. Uh, there are a few things uh, that you should never do in pediatrics but can be done in um, the management of DKA in adult age group. Okay, the objectives of today's lecture is to, over, to give you an overview of diabetes mellitus in general, uh, the pathophysiology of diabetes, diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, how they manifest and how we diagnose them, uh, how to manage and what complications that need to do our best uh, not to um, face. So diagnosis of diabetes uh, mellitus, as you previously learned, we need one of these criteria, either a fasting blood sugar of more than 200 milligram per deciliter, associated with symptoms of hyperglycemia like polyuria or polydipsia, polyphagia, etc., or a fasting blood sugar of 126 or more. Uh, you might depend on an oral uh, glucose tolerance test, so if this is impaired uh, with association with a, an abnormal two-hour postprandial uh, glucocheck of 200 or more, or an hemoglobin uh, A1C level of 6.5 or more, any of them is considered diagnostic of uh, diabetes mellitus. However, uh, the the most sensitive uh, and the the one which represents the accumulative uh, levels of glucose in the body tissues or the body cells is hemoglobin A1C because it represents the level of glucose accumulatively in the past three months uh, approximately. How do diabetic patients uh, present? As I said, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia with weight loss. Uh, just to remind you that insulin uh, is an anabolic hormone, right? Uh, so in the absence of insulin or insufficient production of insulin, our body will shift into a catabolic state. That's why they manifest with polyphagia and weight loss. Okay, we're going to talk about DM type 1 because DKA is a presentation of type 1 diabetes mellitus. It is rarely encountered in DM type 2, especially in pediatric age group. Okay, as we know, DM type 2 is an adult um, pathology rather than a pediatric age group pathology. So the incidence of uh, type 1 DM is approximately 2 in um, per 1,000. Um, the exact cause is unknown, uh, the exact cause of DKA. So as I said, DKA is a complication of DM type 1. Why it happens, no one knows, but we know that there might be some uh, triggers like stress, infection, sepsis, etc. Uh, the incidence of DKA is about between 4 to 8 per 1,000. Um, it's interesting that about 30% of cases with DM type 1, the initial presentation is DKA. So we diagnose them when they present with signs and symptoms of DKA, uh, which is a big percentage, 30%. So every 100 patients or children with DM type 1, 30 of them, the initial presentation would, would be DKA, which is very scary for both us as care providers and uh, their families. Uh, it's the most common cause of uh, mortality amongst patients with DM type 1. So DKA, so D stands for diabetes, as we say, the criteria to diagnose diabetes, uh, roughly a glucose, um, a random blood sugar of 200 or more, ketosis or ketonemia, the presence of ketone bodies in blood and uh, being excreted in urine, and acidosis where the um, ABG, arterial blood gas, or venous blood gas, show a um, pH of less than 7.3 and a bicarbonate level of less than 15. As I was just mentioning about uh, insulin, so it's an enzyme or a hormone produced by our pancreas. 
and it has so many important metabolic functions in our body uh, affecting the brain, the, um, the liver, muscles, and adipose tissue. So the main functions of insulin we need to know so that we can understand the pathophysiology of DKA. So insulin is very important to facilitate entry of glucose into the tissues like into muscles and our adipose tissue rather than being elevated uh, peripherally in the blood. It increases liver uh, glycogenesis uh, and glycolysis. So gly glycolysis increases the glucose utilization. So instead of accumulation of glucose in the blood, it will be um, used by the uh, liver. Increased uh, liver lipid synthesis, also inhibition of glucose production from the liver, hence regulation of glucose levels at any time, uh, stimulate, stimulate protein synthesis and inhibit protein breakdown. That's why it's important for the muscle uh, growth and integrity. Um, insulin is described as uh, the key that unlocks glucose channels. So with the absence of uh, insulin, glucose channels are, are blocked. With its presence, they get open, and this will facilitate the movement of glucose from blood into uh, the cells. So this simplifies the pathogenesis of diabetic, the diabetic ketoacidosis. It looks a bit busy and complicated, but let's try to break it down. So... Pointer? No. Okay. So looking to the most left part of the screen. So with inadequate insulin uh, secretion, there will be increased uh, fatty acid oxidation, formation of ketone bodies, and this will cause acidosis. Acidosis will cause clinical and laboratory manifestations. So clinical manifestations of acidosis, patients do present with vomiting, uh, irritability, and increase in sensible losses. Sometimes they present with severe dehydration. Uh, they start with hyperkalemia as a consequence of acidosis, but with time, due to acidosis and hyperkalemia, renal excretion of potassium will increase, and we will end up having hypokalemia instead. Uh, it also causes renal uh, phosphateless and hypophosphatemia. Um, Inadequate insulin production will lead to uh, gluconeogenesis, the production of glucose in the liver, which is something that we don't want to happen. This will lead to hyperglycemia or increased glucose levels in the blood. Also, inadequate <coughs> insulin secretion will cause glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of glycogen <coughs> stored in the liver. And this as well will cause hyperglycemia. Also, inadequate insulin level will cause um, uh, peripheral glucose uptake and metabolism. Again, this will cause furthermore hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia will increase uh, osmotic diuresis, and by this we'll have uh, dehydration, poor tissue perfusion, and uh, increased lactate. Also, with the osmotic diuresis, this will lead to sodium loss and hyponatremia. Hyponatremia, sodium loss, hyper or hypokalemia, all electrolyte imbalance should be corrected. And this happens, first step of, correct, of correcting these electrolyte imbalance is by correcting the underlying hyperglycemia uh, and insulin deficiency. Okay, moving to the guidelines of how to manage diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, you have to suspect DKA in any patient with who is known to have diabetes even without um, the uh, suggestive glucose reading that we have already mentioned, if the patient have significant, has significant symptoms of um, diabetic ketoacidosis or high, severe hyperglycemia, which includes, so they will have symptoms of hyperglycemia, uh, like polyuria, polydipsia, fatigability, nocturia, and enuresis. Uh, they will also have uh, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Um, because they will have metabolic acidosis, our body will try to overcome the metabolic acidosis by causing what? Respiratory alkalosis, which is 
um, maintained or facilitated by hyperventilation, okay? So the patient will present with what we call cosmal, bre cosmal breathing. Um, they will also present, as I said, with signs of hypovolemia or de inter depleted intravascular uh, volume like tachycardia, uh, poor capillary refill and perfusion, uh, decreased skin turgor. You, all, you learn signs of dehydration previously. Um, signs of dehydration tend to be more prominent in patients with DKA than we see in other causes. So signs of hypovolemia will be very prominent in DKA in comparison, for example, in gastroenteritis. They also present with, um, sorry, they also present with neurological findings or neurological manifestations that include uh, irritability, drowsiness, um, lethargy, altered level of consciousness, which is serious. How to diagnose diab diabetic ketoacidosis? If, so if you encounter a patient in the ER with the previously mentioned symptoms, either the patient is a known case of DM or a new case uh, undiagnosed, you have to send blood tests or a quick um, laboratory evaluation just to confirm your diagnosis, which includes basically, first of all, a, a venous blood sample for venous uh, blood gas or arterial blood gas if that's um, available. So you look at the pH level. So acidosis means that you need to have a pH level of less than 7.3. And then we divide or further subdivide DKA into mild, moderate, severe according to how low the pH uh, level is. Or you look at the bicarbonate level. So if you have a low bicarb of less than 15 millimeter, milliliter, uh, millimole per liter. The second diagnostic criteria is ketonemia, which is the presence of uh, beta hydroxybutyrate in blood uh, or the presence of ketone uh, bodies in urine. We, you need to have plus two, minimum of a plus two to, consider, to be considered significant ketone urea. Um, now, be reminded that sometimes the routine laboratory evaluation to check for a uh, ketone body, they tend to measure uh, acetoacetate or acetone rather than the beta hydroxybutyrate. So initially the patient might have the full blown picture of DKA, but you still can't detect um, uh, the ketone bodies in blood. <coughs> So as I said, DKA is further divided or classified into mild, moderate, uh, and severe, depending on pH level and serum bicarbonate level. So if we have a pH between 7.2 and 7.3, this is uh, mild. 7.1 to 7, and less than 7, sorry, 7.1 to 7.2 or less, this is moderate, and less than 7.1, this is severe uh, DKA. Bicarb level between 10 and 15, this is mild. 5 to 9, this is moderate. And less than 5, this is severe DKA, which might be life-threatening. Okay, so once you reach the diagnosis of DKA, you need to start management or managing the patient. But first of all, you have to document uh, a few findings and a few things that, you need, that need to be in your record as a doctor. So you have to document the level of consciousness. We learn the modified Glasgow Coma Scale in the introductory course. So we use this to uh, document the level of consciousness of the patient. You need to initially document the presenting vital signs, including the heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, and the respiratory rate. When talking about later on about the complication of DKA, we will... Um, review the, the importance of vital signs and how the change of vital signs can indicate some complications like uh, cerebral edema. Uh, you need to document wh whether there is a history of nausea and vomiting. Uh, look for signs uh, of dehydration, uh, measure body weight, and uh, you have to measure the urine output. So, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, the pathophysiology or the cause of DKA is unknown, but we know that in pediatric age group, some triggers might uh, elicit or trigger um, the development of DKA-like infections in pediatric age group, which is a really common trigger for DKA. Uh, sometimes when you're treating a patient with DKA and the patient is not responding uh, um, clinically and uh, lab-wise, there's no improvement uh, in the patient's state. You have to think of an underlying cause that's not being treated, like sepsis. 
uh, which uh, the, the, you might look for some hints whether the patient has um, sepsis or not, like the presence of temperature, instability, fever or hypothermia, hypotension, refractory acidosis despite proper management of hyperglycemia and, and acidosis, and persistent lactic acidosis as well. What blood work you need to initially send? You need to send initially a random blood sugar. As I said, blood gas, either venous or arterial, to measure pH and bicarbonate level at the baseline of the patient. Plasma, sodium, potassium, urea, and creatinine. Ketone uh, level, either in blood or uh, urine. You have also, as I said, to look for underlying cause like infection. Sometimes you need to send a full blood count to look for leukocytosis. However, be aware that leukocytosis can be a finding in DKA in pediatric age group without the presence, without the presence of underlying infection or sepsis. So you can find leukocytosis not related to an underlying infection in uh, kids with DKA. You might do as well chest x-ray if the patient's having respiratory symptoms like tachypnea, decreased um, air entry on one side, uh, abnormal breath sounds, etc. A throat swab if the patient has uh, sore throat, uh, blood culture sometimes looking for focality of the infection. Urine analysis, culture, etc. Okay, general rules to manage uh, DKA. In pediatric age group, usually DKA should be managed in a in an intensive care unit because the patient needs continuous monitoring of the uh, neurological status and vital signs. If hourly, sometimes every hour, we have to keep measuring the vital signs. Uh, initially, as soon as you, you diagnose the patient uh, with DKA in an emergency uh, department setting, you have to provide with a bolus of IV fluid, normal saline IV fluid or Ringer lactate IV fluid. Uh, the volume should be between 10 to 20 mLs per kg. And the reason to why we give this initial uh, bolus of fluid is to, is to um, maintain um, restoration of the effective uh, circulatory volume uh, to replace what we have lost of water and sodium to replace hyponatremia because we're given sodium chloride uh, at a 9% uh, concentration. This, if you uh, improve the uh, effective intravascular circulation, you will improve the glomerular filtration rate. And then the kidney will do its job getting rid of uh, excess uh, ketones and glucose from blood. So as I said, we start with uh, a bolus. Um, if the patient is already on a sub -Q, on sub-Q insulin, you discontinue that because we're going to start with insulin infusion uh, provided uh, intravenously. Um, as I said, the initial fluid bolus should not exceed 20 mLs per kg. If you, for any reason, give more than 20 mLs per kg of initial uh, fluid bolus, you have to subtract the, this from the total fluid deficit that we're going to teach you how to calculate. And you have to carefully document each mL of fluid you, you administer because excess uh, fluid resuscitation might increase the risk of cerebral edema, which is fatal. Okay, so we have, after we provide the patient with the initial fluid bolus, we have to calculate how much fluid, fluid does the patient need for the next 48 hours. So we calculate the total fluid needed over a period of 48 hours, not 24 other not 24 hours. This is totally different in adult age group. So in pediatric, we are very cautious when we administer fluids for a patient with DKA, as I say, to decrease the likelihood of developing uh, cerebral edema. So for fluid deficit, we calculate it according to uh, the severity of DKA or the severity of acidosis. So if the patient has a pH of more than or equals 7.1, uh, this is mild to moderate, and we have to give a 5% fluid deficit. So 5% uh, multiplied by the patient's weight over a period of 48 hours. If the patient has a pH of less than 7.1, it's considered severe DKA, and then we increase the deficit calculation into 10% fluid deficit rather than 5%. 
and then we calculate the uh, fluid maintenance for the patient, and this is according to the patient uh, weight. So, um, as I said, we give uh, sodium chloride. This is the preferred uh, solution to be administered for both maintenance and uh, deficit. Um, we then start to gradually add glucose into the fluid we administer. When glucose levels, blood glucose level levels are, do start to correct, if they reach 250 milligram per deciliter or less, we start to add dextrose or glucose to the fluid we administer. Or if, or if the rate of glucose decline is about, um, I think 100 milligram per hour, uh, because we don't want the a quick or a rapid drop in glucose because a quick correction of hyperglycemia also will increase the likelihood of cerebral edema. So we have to be cautious when we add, um, uh, when to add dextrose to our fluids. Now, usually, as I say, the patient might start with a state of hyperkalemia due to acidosis, and then gradually with time, because of the renal losses of potassium, the patient might manifest with hypokalemia. Okay, so even if the initial blood labs of the patient uh, show uh, a normal uh, potassium uh, level, we usually tend to add potassium to the fluid we calculate. The time needed for a potassium level uh, test to get back to you in a hospital setup, especially in like rush hours, might be more than one hour. So you won't delay adding uh, potassium to fluids, waiting for the blood result of potassium to come back. So we start with roughly a 40 milli equivalent of potassium per each liter. And then when potassium levels do come back, we can adjust according to the level. So if you have a potassium level of less than four, we add 60 milli equivalent per liter. If it's between four and six, which is usually um, the range at which patients uh, present, we add 40 milli equivalent per liter. If it's more than six, you don't need to add any potassium. If you have already added initially potassium, you just discontinue that. If the patient uh, has an, a well-established renal failure or manifesting with signs of acute kidney injury for any reason, uh, you be very cautious when you add potassium. If there are signs of renal failure, you don't add potassium uh, to your fluids, and you need to consult a nephrologist on how to correct hypokalemia. So how to calculate the maintenance? So we explained that we need to initially give a bolus, 10 to 20 mils per kg. This is as soon as you diagnose a patient with DKA, then you need to admit the patient the wards or an intensive care unit, and then you start to calculate the fluid maintenance and deficit. We learned how to um, calculate deficit volume, and then the maintenance, as I said, it's according to the body weight. So roughly, this is a rough estimate, if a patient weighs less than 10 kilograms, we give a rate of 2 milligram, 2 mils per kg per hour. This is the hourly rate of maintenance fluid. If the patient weighs between 10 and 40 kilograms, we give about one mil per kg per hour. Again, this is maintenance. This is separate from the deficit that we have calculated according to the acidosis level. And if the patient weighs more than 40 kilograms, then there is a fixed rate, which is 40 mil uh, per hour. You will note that these are the minimal uh, volumes of maintenance we calculate. As I said, because we are really cautious when we administer fluids to a patient with DKA not to cause uh, cerebral edema. Okay, as I said, initially we give 10 to 20 mils of a fluid bolus, normal saline or Ringer lactate. If for any reason an error happened or you gave more than 20, you subtract what you gave above 20 from the total deficit volume that you calculated. So I will give you an example. Before we move to the example, never give a patient, a pediatric patient with DKA sodium bicarb correction, okay? We know that they present with a decreased level of sodium bicarb, but we don't give them replacement. This will increase the risk of uh, cerebral edema. When you correct the underlying cause, when you correct the hyperglycemia, when you correct uh, the insulin deficiency, 
sodium bicarbonate level will automatically correct. So we don't give any correction in pediatric age group, which is not the case in adult age group. So now let's have an example. So a 20 kilogram, six year old, uh, presented with signs and symptoms of DKA. The pH initially is 7.15, uh, and he was uh, given a 10 cc per kg sodium chloride bolus in the ER. How to calculate maintenance and deficit fluid volume? So the deficit, so the pH is 7.15. What do you think? Should we calculate 5% deficit or 10%? Five. So we said 7.1 and above, this is mild to moderate, so 5% deficit. If it's less than 7.1, this is severe, and we choose 10% deficit uh, calculation. So 5% divided by the body weight, which is 20, this is 1,000 mils of deficit. As I said, we don't give them over 24-hour period. We give them slowly over a period of 48 hours not to cause cerebral edema again. So we divide the total volume, deficit volume, which is 1,000 mils over 48 hours. We will end up having um, 21 mils per hour, right? Now we need to calculate the maintenance. So the patient is weighing 20 kilograms. As we said, according to uh, the rough uh, body weight estimate, we give 1 mil per kg per hour. This is the maintenance rate. So one mil per kg, the patient weighs 20 kilograms, so 20 mils per hour. We add this maintenance rate to the deficit rate, which is 21. So 21 plus 20 will have 41 mils per hour. This is the fluid rate at which the patient should be maintained for the next 48 hours. Another example, you have a 60 kilogram, 16 year old girl presented again with signs and symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis. Initial pH is 6.9. What do you think? Mild, moderate, or severe? Severe. Uh, who was given already 30 mils per kg of sodium chloride or 0.9 uh, sodium chloride for circulatory collapse. So she was uh, hypovolemic. That's why she was given 20 mils per kg rather than, uh, sorry, she was given 30 mils rather than 20 mils per kg. So now we want to calculate the deficit and maintenance. So deficit, because this is severe, 10% per body weight. So 10% by 60 kilograms will have 6,000 mils over a period of 48 hours. However, we need to subtract the extra 10 mils that we gave initially, the bolus. So we said you can give up to 20 mils, but she was given 30 mils. So there's an excess of 10 mils, right, per kg. So we subtract this 10 mils per kg out of the total deficit that we just calculated. So 10 mils by 60 equals 60 mils. So we remove 60 mils out of the 6,000 mils we will end up uh, and divide the result uh, over 48 hours, so the rate will be 113 mils per hour. For the maintenance, because she weighs 60 kilograms, she needs to be on a fixed approximate rate of 40 mils per kg per hour, or 40 mils per hour, which is uh, about 153 mils per hour when we multiply by the weight. Sorry, a fixed rate of 40 mils per hour. So we add 40 mils of maintenance to 113 mils per hour of a deficit. We'll have one, 153 mils per hour. Okay. Now, after we start or calculate the fluid correction, deficit and maintenance, we have to start uh, um, supplying the patient with a deficit insulin because the, the whole problem started because of deficit insulin level. So we need to start on intravenous insulin infusion. Usually we start this infusion after one to two hours of initiating or commencing the IV fluid um, infusion. Now, when we give insulin, what we do is that we suppress the hepatic glucose output and then we suppress ketogenesis. As a res result, we will stimulate peripheral glucose uptake. So the peripheral or blood glucose level will drop and then we'll start to gradually improve uh, ketosis. We start with the rate. The rate of insulin varies from not 0.05 mil uh, or unit uh, per kg per hour 
up to a maximum rate of 0.1 uh, unit per kg per hour. The rate at which you start depends again on how severe the DKA is. For example, patients who present with initial DKA, so this is the first presentation of DKA, they tend to have a rapid response to exogenous insulin. So if a patient presents to me for the first time with DKA, uh, I will be very cautious and I will start with the minimal rate, which is not 0.05 units per kg per hour. However, on subsequent occasions, the DKA might uh, become more resistant to insulin, so I might choose a higher rate to start with. And always, when we check regularly the clinical states of the patient, the laboratory evaluation, we will start to fiddle around the rate. So it's not a fixed rate. You either increase or decrease according to um, the resolution of, sympt of symptoms and uh, of laboratory results. We don't give bolus dose of insulin, so this is again one of the lethal mistakes some patients, some doctors do if they are not familiar with pediatric DKA. Uh, boluses of insulin are given regularly in ED setups for adult patients. But again, this is not the practice of uh, in pediatric age group. So if a doctor is not so very familiar with DKA in pediatric age group, insulin boluses might be given. This will lead to rapid drop of glucose, rapid correction, and increased risk of um, cerebral edema. If the child, which is not the case in our country, we seldom have um, sub-Q insulin pumps, but if, it, if it's the case and the patient has a sub-Q insulin uh, pump, you have to stop the pump because now the patient will be depending on exogenous IV insulin instead. So, as I said, we start with sodium chloride fluid and then we gradually start to add dextrose to our uh, fluid. Um, now, when to add glucose, as I said, when glucose, peripheral glucose level drops to 250 milligram per deciliter, or if the rate of glucose correction is above 100 milligram per deci per hour, we start to give the patient exogenous dextrose. We start by 5% dextrose. We add it to the total fluid that we have calculated just to make sure that the patient doesn't have very quick correction of the hyperglycemia. When to stop the IV fluid infusion? So when ketosis resolves, be aware that acidosis, uh, pH, and bicarb, they improve more quickly than ke ketonemia and ketonuria. So the patient might improve, might improve, the pH might improve, bicarb might also improve. However, the patient might have still have some residual ketonuria, which is okay. Kidneys do need some time to totally excrete ketone out of the body. The patient also needs to be fully alert, conscious, and oriented and in a very good clinical status when you decide to stop the IV fluid therapy. And the patient should be able to maintain oral intake without uh, nausea or vomiting. So when we admit the patient to an intensive care unit, the main reason why to why we do that is to do regular monitoring of the patient's status, starting from the vital signs. Uh, we also need to do hourly check on a glucose blood level, peripheral glucose by glucocheck. We need to very carefully monitor um, how much fluid we give and how much fluid the patient uh, urinates. So we need to have a strict input-output chart where the nurses document um, how much urine the patient gives out. If the patient is on diapers, we weigh the diapers. Otherwise, we might ask the patient to uh, urinate in a urinal where we have to measure the total volume of urine output. We need to also keep checking on the level of consciousness using the modified Glasgow Coma scale that you have already learned. Now, um, when the patient starts to stabilize, we move to checking every two hours and sometimes every two hours um, sending blood levels of glucose, not glucotrix. So glucotrix initially hourly, and then when the patient improves, we send uh, blood levels of glucose every two to four hours. We keep checking with the pH and CO2 levels as, and electrolytes as well, like sodium, potassium, and urea, and the levels of ketones in both uh, blood and urine, but we depend on ketone in blood more than 
what we do um, on Yerin. Um, each time you see the patient, you need to start with to face-to-face -face evaluate the patient every two hours. So it's not enough to call the nurse saying, please draw some blood samples, please let me know how the vital signs look like. This is not enough. You have to go and face to face, you do proper evaluation face to face every four hours because some signs of cerebral edema, early signs of cerebral edema can be difficult to, um, uh, coat up by nurses or, um, um, like healthcare providers with no sufficient experience with DKA. And then you have to, do this more frequently if the patient is less than two years of age or if the patient initially presented with severe DKA with a pH of less than 7.1. Each time you go and see the patient, you have to comment on the overall clinical status. Does the patient look well, ill, alert, conscious oriented, irritable, calm? Uh, you have to comment on the vital signs, any abnormal neurological signs you have to comment on, like headache uh, or irritability. You have to check blood results that you send. So it's not enough to say send a pH or bicarb levels every two hours without you checking and interpret the results. Sometimes we need to send ECG if the patient has electrolyte imbalance like hypokalemia. And again, you have to have a look at the cumulative fluid balance record. This is a chart that we usually use for patient with DKA and things that we need to document and mention like the pupil size, symmetry, the presence of neurological symptoms like headaches, um, what fluid uh, is the patient on, what type of fluid, what's the rate, um, the urine output, uh, the total input or total fluid taken by the patient, and uh, the levels of pH, CO2, blood gas, etc. Okay. Now, when we do a regular checkup, as we said, we interpret blood results. So if I look at the ketone in blood, the ketone levels, and they are less than th 3 millimoles per liter, this indicates that the patient is improving. Um, then I will start to think about reducing the insulin rate. So if I started the, or commenced the patient on not 0.07 unit per kg per hour of insulin, I might go down to 0.06 and then 0.05, etc. However, if the ketone levels are still high, despite proper IV fluid resuscitation and insulin management, you need to think about increasing insulin rate to the maximum rate, which is 0.1 unit per kg per hour to try and switch off ketogenesis. 10% glucose or dextrose uh, rather than 5% uh, dextrose sometimes might be considered um, when you need to increase the rate of insulin. Because if you increase the rate of insulin, you'd expect uh, hypoglycemia. Again, we don't want rapid correction or rapid uh, drop of glucose levels. So we fiddle around uh, the dextrose uh, concentration. So if I, let's say, increase insulin rate from 0.5 to 0.7, I might as well increase, change dextrose from 5% to 10%. When to start sub -Q. So if the patient improves clinically well, uh, labs are improving, acidosis, ketonemia are improving, the patient is doing well, no nausea, no vomiting, can tolerate oral intake, I will start thinking of Disconnect, discontinuing the uh, IV infusion and the insulin infusion. But as a bridging uh, method, I start sub-Q insulin 30 minutes to one hour before I discontinue the IV fluid and IV insulin. Moving to complication of diabetic ketoacidosis. Remember, DKA is a very fatal uh, pathology. Patients can die without proper... Uh, prompt evaluation and management. So one of the most fatal causes and the most common uh, cause of mortality in patients with DKA is cerebral edema. It happens in uh, one to five percent of patients presenting with DKA. Mortality rate is very high. It's told to be around 25 percent. Usually or typically uh, cerebral edema do happen in the first six to 12 hours of uh, management. So after 
six hours of starting fluid and insulin resuscitation. And as I discussed before, this might be related to incorrect volume uh, provided, incorrect uh, type or of fluid, uh, and incorrect dextrose percentage. Risk factor uh, factors of uh, cerebral edema. If the patient initially presents with a very high blood urea nitrogen level, if the patient has an initial low uh, CO2 level, if the patient um, sodium level fails to correct even though or despite proper correction of glucose. So we know that hyperglycemia, as we uh, mentioned, causes shifting of uh, sodium from extracellular space to intracellular space, leading to hyponatremia. However, when you correct hyperglycemia, this hyponatremia should correct as well. So if the patient's um, sodium level doesn't correct despite good uh, glucose levels, this indicates a more... Um, that the patient is more liable to develop cerebral edema. And again, treatment with bicarbonate. We never administer bicarbonate to pediatric age group with DKA. So the early manifestations, the less alarming manifestations of DKA are headaches, agitation, irritability, continuous crying, unexpected fall in um, heart rate and increase in blood pressure. So that's why it is important to that we in, initially start with an hourly check on uh, vital signs and Q two to four hour check face to face on the patient to check for the, these early manifestation of cerebral edema. If uh, isolated early on, cerebral edema can be treated easily. However, late uh, diagnosis and treatment of cerebral edema, the patient might end up with uh, permanent neurological sequelae. More important or more alarming signs and manifestations of cerebral edema, uh, deterioration in level of consciousness, abnormal breathing pattern like apneas or respiratory poses, uh, oculomotor nerve palsy, uh, inadequate or asymmetrical pupil size, and inadequate dilatation. If you suspect cerebral edema, you have to promptly treat. So we treat with mannitol and hypertonic saline, as mentioned. Um, one of the common um, complications of uh, DKA is hypokalemia, which is a potassium level of less than 3 millimol per liter. Uh, if the patient is hypokalemic, you might think of stopping uh, the insulin infusion for a while and then repeats potassium levels uh, later on. Sometimes you need to administer uh, potassium if it doesn't correct after discontinuing uh, insulin infusion. If you need to administer an I, uh, IV potassium, you need to consult an intensivist because you need to do, to do so through a central line. You can't administer KCL through a peripheral line. This will increase the risk of uh, venous thrombombolism. Aspiration pneumonia. Uh, patients with DKA and impaired level of consciousness might have vomiting and then aspiration pneumonia. So it's important for those with altered level of consciousness or severe DKA to insert a nasogastric tube uh, for feeding. Other association or clinical features, patient might still have, even when you correct hyperglycemia, might still, might still complain of abdominal pain. This might be related to liver swelling, uh, gastritis, bladder retention, urine retention, or alias. Um, however, the kid might be just unlucky so with DKA, he might or she might have appendicitis as well. So you have to uh, thoroughly evaluate any kid with abdominal pain to rule out an underlying uh, surgical cause like appendicitis. Be aware that increased amylase level is a common manifestation in DKA. How to avoid future episodes of diabetic ketoacidosis? You have to discuss the case with the parents or the carers uh, to stand on the reasons why this episode happened and what to do to prevent this from occurring in the future. Um, always think of either suboptimal 
sub-Q insulin, if the patient is already diagnosed with uh, diabetes, he's already on insulin, uh, double-check if the dose is uh, adequate for the weight, and double-check on the compliance. Sometimes you might face compliance issues, or double and for example, if you want to check the, site, the uh, compliance, you have to look for site of sub-Q insulin administration. So if you can't see any bruises on the abdomen, um, on the upper limbs, for example, or on the thighs, that means that the patient is not having his uh, sub-Q insulin. And that's it.